advocacy and conservation and environmental activism and launch this annual um, festival now in, in its third year. And thank you all of my colleagues here, Tanya and Susa, uh, who are making this beautiful uh, event happen every year. But anyhow, we, that's the crossroads. The crossroads is, um, I tell him when he's telling me about what he should do, and I'm like, you know what, I'm getting tired with this activism. You know, three years of non-paid labor, you know, <laughs> you know, to save the world or save ourselves. Um, I miss writing, I miss that loneliness, that sacred space of encountering the page and searching to expand the parameters of meaning, searching for the right metaphor, which you can't find in activism, which you can't find in the marketplace. And so I really like this starting with that, because in a way, you're kind of, there's a shift going on. H how does that feel being in LA now? Well, it, it feels interesting, though, I, I have to say, that um, I too have come to this, this feeling of, of why write. And, and some of that comes from a sense of um, recognizing the limitations of the word and the limitations of ideas themselves and wondering if we are just generating more and more ideas that keep us on this endless cycle of conceptual reality that doesn't really provide an escape from it that doesn't provide a sense of spaciousness, of true liberation, um, of, of deep peace, but that continues to create the same kinds of dualisms that are embedded within our language, right? That keep us in a, in a sort of state of, of conflict with ourselves and others. So I too have reached this, this sort of um, wondering if writing itself is the way to express my true um, um, aspiration to contribute, you know? And at the same time, as, as um, because it all is sort of co-emergent, um, I was thinking about this panel and why art matters. And I do believe that uh, one of the reasons that, that art is so important is that it does connect us to something that is bigger than ourselves. That it does allow us, even when we are working with the word, even we are, when we are addressing ideas, um, that we are, at, in our encounter with this mysterious force, that we are somehow then touching that which is, is greater, right? And, and it is allowing us to not only feel connected to others in this human realm, but it is pointing to something that is truly, if you want to call it God, if you want to call it the divine, if you want to call it karma, if you want to call it space, whatever you want to call it, it is pointing out that there is something bigger at play here, and that is one of the key reasons for me that art matters, because it, it, it reminds us of that that, that, that we have that in us, that ability to recognize this, this very important thing. Um, and so I've, I've been really thinking about that. Um, and also when I was coming, I was thinking about what, what else I could share from my life uh, on this topic, and, and it occurred to me that I don't know anyone that um, has not had their lives in one way or another saved by art, you know? That, um, you know, all of my artist friends who grew up in very difficult environments turned to books, um, you know, people who had illnesses turned to, you know, paintings. They would spend days in museums. Um, people who were dealing with mental illness turned to music and lost themselves in music, you know, and, and found a place that they could survive that was free of the, the sort of demonic, the, the difficulties they were having mentally. And so, you know, one of the reasons I think art matters is that it, it saves our lives, you know. It's a place of refuge, hopefully. Um, and that is key, you know, that, to have that realization for me. I know art definitely saved my life, in many ways, as a creator of art and also as someone who grew up in an environment that was very much about recognizing and cultivating beauty and understanding that beauty heals and that beauty comes about in a, in a kind of creative, um, from the creative impulse, you know, to create your environment in such a way that it is beautiful and that that feeds you and, and provides nourishment to your soul and your psyche. Um, and, and so that's also why art matters. And, and I think, you know, one of the, I'm a huge fan of Irene's 
work. I'm a huge, huge kind of fan. You. No, huge fan. Um, and and I think we we are we're similar in that another reason that I think we both feel strongly that art matters is that we um, have both in our work decided to um, talk about things that are very controversial or that actually give voice to ideas and human beings that, that often don't have a voice in the larger culture and who desperately need a voice, right? So I think we've both been involved in creating com new communities around new ideas that have been part of a cultural conversation that has resulted in change. Um, for the good, we hope, you know, but, it, but you know, if we don't want to judge it, we can just say at least, for, you know, for change. <laughs> um, and so I think that's another thing that is so important about, about art, that it creates space for new subjectivities, for new experiences to be validated and honored, and new space for us as artists, you know, to survive. I love that piece of voicing. I think um, the voicing, um, I came to this country as a nine-year-old monolingual child. I only spoke Spanish. And I went straight from Puerto Rico to Boynton, New Hampshire, to an Episcopalian boarding school. And, um, and I remember, you know, being bent down by shame. And, and the shame didn't make any, you know, at that time you don't know exactly what it is you're feeling, but what you're feeling is manifested by not speaking, <laughs> basically, or feeling that your voice is not in the right place, or that there's not a space for you to, to voice who you are. And, um, I remember that I found in this school, there was a little bookshelf in the library that was dedicated to Spanish language books. And I remember, I, 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 and most of them were the life of the saints in Spanish. <laughs> I read every single life of the saints. And I remember my back slowly straightening up. And um, of course, it's only looking back that I see that, you know, phenomenology of the reading piece happening. but. I do know that books cushioned my shame, articulated in a way the primitive uh, upbringing of mine where my parents, like many parents that mean the best but have limited tools to raise you because they have poor uh, emotional intelligence and just because they're the children of even poorer you know, parents, um, that you, I grew up with mixed messages, mixed messages. Um, I love you so much. I'm gonna comb your hair every day and dress you perfectly. And tomorrow I'm gonna kill myself, which is what my mother did one day after my brother's wedding when I was eight. And so that mixed message, that, that, that crushing violence that you grow up with, you know, that 24 seven soap opera of our primitive parents and families uh, and countries, because you know, there's not much different between my parents and, and the Bush years, you know, and, and still today, when women don't have maternity leave, I mean, talk about a crazy mixed message of a democracy. You can see it in the big picture, you can see it in the small picture, right? And in a way, our bodies, and that's what you and I share a lot, is like, as writers, we've been always trying to find a connection between, you know, our private bodies and what we do in our private realms, and, and finding the parallels between that and the national families and the cultural families that have impregnated us with those, with those narratives. And um, so the voice in peace for me touches me deeply because that's what happened to me in Boynton, New Hampshire. I, I, was, I could not speak, but those Life of the Saints, which really, were, they were very boring, <laughs> but somehow they were in my language. They were validating my monolingual, monolingualism and they were giving me, you know, not high, there, it's not high art, but it was still art. Because in a way, you know, you can go back to, I mean, for me, it's all about the Socratic mandate of self-consciousness. In a way, you can look at the emotional life of nations and the emotional life of peoples as, as, a, as a mirror of, um, of the relationship be between parents and children. You know, and if you look back, you see a slow but surely development you know, of, that makes human species, you know, humans, you know, it's this, this self-consciousness, this awareness that we are unique selves with unique histories, and that 
you know, you take a bird's eye view, has slowly but consistently been getting better. <laughs> um, and so that, in a way, we'll be better parents, you know, and our kids hopefully will be, you know, even if they regress two or three generations, I think that overall we're moving into higher consciousness. And in part is because that piece of the voicing, and in part is because the arts, you know, from the Renaissance, you know, after the Middle Ages, when things took off and Freud came along and, you know, and everything else, um, we have been building on to this higher consciousness, of course, you know, I don't want to leave behind the Asia, <laughs> but um, in terms of us as Western subjects, that has been very important. And so, yeah, why art matters for me originally was because it broke down my shame and it made me uh, somehow feel that I was worth it and that there was something bigger than myself, and so. Yeah, yes, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it allowed you to write your brilliant books. Rebecca wrote a review of my book that was censored by Book, book Forum, and that's an interesting story. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that, yeah. Um, well, Irene wrote this very powerful book, I don't know if you all have read it, but called um, Impossible Motherhood, Testimony of an Abortion Addict. And um, uh, it's a beautiful memoir about uh, a relationship between a young woman coming of age in many ways intellectually and a very powerful um, sort of academic mentor, mentor figure. Um, and, and uh, you know, my reading of it was very large, I think. It was very different than most people's readings, but I really connected it with, and so the, the book is about her experience um, in this relationship and, and the, the mentor's drive to kind of control her sexuality and her fertility and, and her um, refusal in some ways to go along with his desire for her not to have a child, right? what did you say? And, um, and one of the things that I loved about the book is that it's very rare that that kind of relationship, which, is so, which has so much of a power imbalance in it and is so easily talked about as you know, a victim and a victimizer, um, that, that, that she was able to really glean what was powerful from the relationship, that the, this mentor, this person, this man, actually supported her becoming a writer, taught her things like how to sail, um, even when he was, he was in some ways so brutal in, in, his, in, his, in, his, in his approach, he, that, that, that there was something happening there. And that also, I connected it really to, to sovereignty and, and Puerto Rican sovereignty, and understanding that the ways in which imperialism has worked um, between the Americas and, and Puerto Rico has had a lot to do with the sterilization of women in Puerto Rico. And so I really felt that the abortions and the, the, the cycle of refusing to allow this man to stop you from becoming pregnant was a, a, an echo of a, of a refusal um, to allow yourself to be sterilized and to, you know, I mean, I really took it out. I read that <laughs> review when she sent it to me, and I felt my book was a footnote of her review. No. I was like, oh my God, this woman, you know, that's, that's, that's why art matters, you know, because, and in, in this takes, you know, art to the level of, you know, where are the limits of art? What makes an art, you know, a, a piece of work, uh, an artistic text? And of course, in the last 50 years, we know that, you know, nonfiction, Good nonfiction is art as well, and so her review, her critical, um, her critical analysis was even more artistic than my own book, and that's wow. how I said, "Oh my God!" It enhanced my own parameters and raised the bar for for that self-awareness. And that's so, very nice. no, that's you, Rebecca. It was a joy. And I Rebecca, loved it. tell us a little bit about your own life. You have a very interesting life, informing your art and how that art has, in a way, saved you. Yes, okay. Um, so, I think that each of my, my books, in a way, has, um, and, and, and this is also part of why art matters, I think, for all of us. Um, at, from this side of it, as the artist, I can say that each of my, my books has, has um, 
has saved me or has, 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 has allowed me to continue to evolve in a certain way. It's cleared the ground for me to continue to develop so that I haven't gotten stuck, uh, hopefully, in one place, right? So I grew up in a very literary and also politically um, strong environment, a very feminist environment. And, and part of what happened as a result of that was that my narrative, the story of who I am as a human being, was kind of written for me by, you know, um, by the movement that I grew up in, the civil rights movement, by the feminist movement that I grew up in, by my mother, who's a very well-known writer and who's written a lot about you know, her relationship with children. And I felt a very strong need to sort of reclaim my own narrative. Um, and then also, part of my impulse as a writer, as a creator, is to use my own experience to connect with, with, a, with a whole either generation or a group of people who I feel are also sharing this experience. So my first book, To Be Real, Changing, what was it called? Changing, wait, wait, To Be Real, Telling the Truth and Changing the Face of Feminism. So it was about young women coming into um, their feeling that they could confront and challenge and question second wave feminism and bring a new perspective to the table because I was very concerned that we were losing a whole generation of activists because of the rigidity of second wave ideology. And so not only had that played out in my personal life, but I saw it playing out in the culture. And so I did, that was my first book. Black, White, and Jewish, you know, growing up as a product of the civil rights movement and of two very distinct cultures, and they divorced, my parents divorced when I was very young, and so I ended up moving back and forth between a sort of white, upper-class Jewish community and a sort of Afro-Bohemian artist community. And, do I have to hurry up? Are we running out of time? I have five minutes. Oh my God, and I have like seven books, so I'm not gonna do that. So, so I'll basically just say, I mean, Black, White, and Jewish was, I think, the key, was one of the most important for me because I had grown up feeling so fragmented that my, my actually my, my being I, I could not figure out how I could be whole. And so in writing the book and in, and in really um, uh, including these slivers of myself, I actually was able to, to create a symbolic, you know, Rebecca that was whole. And it was the first time that I sort of felt like, okay, it's possible because all of the differences can exist in this one place. And so even though the book was very challenging to many in my family, as any of you who write memoir know, probably, or have heard about all this, it was, it, I, I paid a heavy price for it. The, the, the benefit was that I didn't go insane. <laughs> Oh, the prices, oh, I don't want to even talk about the prices okay. anymore. Because part of also I feel like writing for me at this point in my practice is I write to let go. You know what I mean? I write to remember, to honor the moment, and hope it helps me and everybody else, and okay. And then to move on, you know, to have the next experience. And so I don't hold this anymore in my, in my body like I did. But, but people were very upset. We'll just leave it at that. But I survived. You know, I realized that if I hadn't done this work, I may have had a breakdown, you know, I may not have, have made it. Um, and so I'm very grateful to, to the process and, um, and to my own understanding that I could heal through this creative work, you know. So, and many people have felt very, very helped by the work. So that's also very gratifying, you know, that's why we do it, I always think, we're doing our work in, in solitude and isolation, and we often don't realize that the people who need our work are moving toward us. We're moving toward them, they're moving toward us, and the moment of magic, the moment of the ripening, is when the work meets the people that it is intended to meet, that you, you don't know. You know. So you have to have, for me, I have to have faith that they are coming and they need it. And when that happens, then you feel like, okay, I did it. You know. Or somebody. We, this came back to the beginning, to your yes. moving from Hawaii to Los Angeles, where we were trying to figure out this, this space that is alone with a space that is in communion. Yes. And in a way, you brought it back together with what you just said. Yes. Because I hope the book so. actually does that in itself, yes. as, mm -hmm. a pro, as, a, as a thing in itself, as a being in itself. Yes. And it's propelled by that faith, because if you don't have that faith, you know, uh, who was this wonderful writer that said that if the carpenter. Um, doesn't show up to the shop, people will miss him because people need the shoes to be fixed. But if you don't show up to the 
to your white page, nobody's going to miss you because the book doesn't exist, you know? So it's an act of faith and, and you're really alone there. Yes. And I think, and there are so many people who will miss our work, you know, or, or the work of, of so many of the wonderful writers who've been here these last two days. Um, they will miss it because they, we're, we're working on some plane that we don't really understand. You know, it's not about me. It's about something that is true about my body being here in this time, in this place, and my impulse being to, to commit it to words and, and this form. It's not, about, it's not about me. It's about that's what's happening. And so there's, a, there's an understanding that um, if I don't show up and let it happen, there will be a space um, that, and there will be a place of missing and something will not catalyze, something will not manifest if I can't get out of the way I, you know, of doing that, that work, you know. I like that. That's a responsibility piece. I like that. See. Sí. Sí, claro. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. It's hard to hear in the back, so I think we're going to... Thank you. Thanks, Jules. Hi, Jules. Okay. <laughs> All right. So each of you have written very courageous memoirs, and you took risks in writing each one. And I'm wondering not so much about what the public response was to your books, but what the response, how the response shaped you as an artist, um, whether owning voice, um, uh, witnessing one's own courage, and how that changed your process of um, creating additional work. So how is it, uh, let's see. Well, you know, I've now written two very difficult memoirs for people, uh, and I've had a lot of backlash and, and resistance. So, um, after the first one, I was, I was, it wasn't that I was emboldened, but I felt even more committed to telling the truth, my truth. And that allowed me to do the other books. So I did a book about masculinity and revisioning masculinity and how important it is to let go of, you know, what we think of as, ma anyway. So, so that was all good. Then Baby Love, which was more confrontational. But now I have come to feel like I no longer want to injure anyone or not upset them, but I, I, I've, I feel like there must be a way to write that doesn't, that, that, that can be both discerning and clear and honest, but also can create more connectivity and openness. So I, do, I don't feel, I feel like I'm moving out. I feel like I've resolved, it, it almost feels developmental as a human being, do you know what I mean? It's almost like moving out of adolescence. It's like I feel like I don't need to do that anymore. And that at this point in my life, I want to create more peace. I want to. I want to protect the people I love a little more, um, and it's not so much about crying out about my suffering, you know. However, I couldn't have gotten here if I hadn't done those, so I feel okay, you know. I love that because um, it's it's a very interesting process. Um, my second book, you know, both books were, were controversial, but the first book was, uh, was, I lied a lot in that first memoir. And in the second one, it was a kind of rewrite of the first one. It was a, a, an exercise on, on trying to be truer, knowing and aware that as I was shedding skins of inauthenticity, that this was just gonna be a portrait of this decade and that the next decade might, you know, deconstruct the previous one. So. But still, it cost me a lot. You know, my grandmother disinherited me. I'm still battling with the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico. Um, she, she, she has died, you know, posthumously. 
But it's, you know, um, I mean, that plays as well as I'm engaged, you know, trying to write a third memoir on motherhood with this one as a star. <laughs> um, I've been asking myself those questions, you know, and, and, and what I think I'm feeling, which is similar to yours, but maybe I'm not that developed yet or haven't evolved yet, I think I might need to scream a little bit more, which means calling other entities into account and, and making them more accountable so that there is a more equitable you know, space for, for truth to show up. And I'm still in that space, but I know that there will be a space that gets closer to this. And, and right now, you know, going back to why art matters and, and why I write these books, you know, the second book also got me into a two-year protection program in the state of Colorado because of all the death threats I received from the, from the far right. And, and so, um, you still do it even if you get 54 rejections and your agent gives up on you and you know you still do it because i think ultimately and we go back to the socratic mandate of self examination that's what the that's what art gave me. That's what reading those books and encountering books. And I still remember, you know, the two days I was totally in a trance after reading Anne Frank when I was 13 year old in a Catholic convent in Spain, alone and miserable with all this, you know. I, I felt for, as foreign as I felt in New Hampshire. And these people were speaking my language, but they were Spaniards and nuns. So it still was different and in castrating in a way. And so here I am reading Anne Frank and, I, and I, did, I didn't even know what Judaism was, but this girl trapped in an attic, having to ask permission to exist every single morning and not be in people's ways, that was my story. As an orphan abandoned by my mother and by the sequela of family trauma and, and, and political persecution that I endured because of my grandmother's actions. And so you still do it because ultimately what you feel is that, that what art gives you as a gift, as a student of art, and eventually you become an artist, is this sense that your, tics, your personal tics and antics really shrink in the face of others' tics and antics, and that you see yourself as a global citizen, and you see yourself as part of this bigger picture, and, and then empathy starts to drive everything, and it's not about you anymore. And that's where you, I think you're at now. I'm trying. <laughs> I mean, I'm a student, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that is also why art matters. And, and when I was thinking about this, that was the other thought, that we, we start with trying to have empathy for ourselves as we write, as we work, and we hope that our work encourages others to have greater empathy for others, and then it goes on and on until we all have more empathy for the earth, and then for the universe, and then for the many universes, and then that is how slowly the world, hopefully, um, will evolve, you know, um, you know. So that is definitely a process that I'm really invested in now, is trying to get to peace. You know, it's very important to me. Rebecca, earlier you talked about consciousness, divine, the hula, right? We're in Boulder, right? <laughs> Any of these namings. Um, and it, that really ties in for me when you talked about uh, the casualties that you took from writing, the, the casualty and courageousness at the same time. It's like its own contradiction, right? Uh, and what comes to me is the healing process that's involved in that that's not just about you, it's about others. And even, the, even those that went all the way to abandonment with Irene or the political... Um, uh, um, consequence or even the personal safety that for both of you that for me in, in my line of work I really see that it paves a path for potential healing and likely actual healing for many through the life cycle so thank you both for um, for for building up to that so for me it's really about that the healing that comes out of it thanks Welcome. That is so interesting. I'm so glad that you added that, added that to the conversation because that's true. That part of creating the the telling one's truth and then having the conflict that is part of getting to the peace and the healing, as opposed to stuffing or not bringing it out, and then it and then it festers. And if you can find a healthy way, you know, to get through to the healing, it's fair. It's fair. That's the next. Yes, and it's, 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 um, 
it's that idea of co-emergence. You know, you have you have pain and you have joy. The, the, you know, healing and woundedness. It's important to remember that. That's great. Thank you. What about um, <clears throat> rage? Uh, things at un injustice versus love, maybe of the natural world, and sort of a balance between what you get renewed from maybe nature, from your, I've liked your festivals about nature that you've done here in Boulder, and what um, persuades you to, to do something to create, whether, it, I think Nader said something about he would go walking in a slum and that would motivate him to try and change things, but Cousteau would say things about you have to first love something before you want to protect it or, or feel in harmony or connected to it. And do you guys do things where you go climb a tree or just <laughs> sit by a stream well, or something? We give birth. We, do give we give birth. That's we have a duty. <laughs> More yes. than climbing a tree. Yeah. But you can go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, what exactly are you wanting to know? Like really deeply, truly, what do you want to know right now? I guess it's where you find your course, of what you're going to do with your lives and what you're going to create, whether it's from community and friends and actions and protests or from giving birth and from hiking or I don't know, that kind of thing. You can work with that. Okay, so for, for me, I find that um, I have to feel very strongly that whatever it is that I'm working on is somehow what other people are working on. So that, it, so that I'm, I'm in some kind of conversation with the larger consciousness. And that's not just me. A lot of writers don't, don't feel that way. And, and, and often their work absolutely connects with the larger consciousness. And, it, and it's not a flaw that they don't think that way. But for me, in order to decide what I'm doing next, the organic energy has to be that it will have a meaning that's bigger than, than me. And that I will enter into uh, you know, a conversation with someone and that my, my work will have meaning for them in their lives. Otherwise, it's very difficult for me to get interested. Um, it doesn't always have to be overtly political, though I tend to think that almost everything has a, pol a quote unquote political connection, you know? Um, it has to be something that I feel needs to be worked through in my own psyche or my own mind in order to be released. You know, because I want to be free. I want my work to serve as something that will free me, <laughs> you know, so that I'm not constantly carrying around ideas. And, and part of it is when you, when you have this sort of mind of thoughts that are repetitive and intrusive and discursive and, and, and not really super helpful, it's, it's been wonderful for me to be able to just commit them to the page and then let go. So I'm usually driven by the desire for freedom as well. I'd like to thank both of our panelists for discussing why art matters. Um, and I feel like both of them have a lot to share from their works and their lives and what you know, they said today in the session. Um, so as a sign of our thanks, I have scarves for both of you. And actually, there's one more scarf back there if you want one too. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Green for accomplishment. Well, thank you all so much for coming here and staying with us at the end. Um, I know we weren't in the program, so I feel like somehow you managed to make it, and that's very meaningful for us, I think. Yeah? So thank you. I hope you. Thank you.